All right, I see the light. Uh, as you know, the lectures are taped, so I need to start exactly on time. Um, so there is a website for the course. Unfortunately, I realized five minutes before I came that I did something with my little finger as I was editing the website, and the whole thing was deleted. OK, so uh, hopefully we can go back to the history of the website and. Uh, and put it in place. So you may want, the only thing I want you to do is just uh, uh, take a note of this website because everything, including the videos, are going to be posted in the lectures and everything else is going to be posted there. The, um, you know, this is the second course in the series that I'm teaching related to machine learning and I noticed uh, a few days ago that about half of the class is not taking the first course, okay, which is very challenging. Because usually when I open my mouth, half of the class drops the course. Uh, when I give the first homework, the other half drops the, the course. So now if we don't have half of the class uh, involved in the course, that can be a challenge. Okay? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make uh, those who took the course in the, in the fall a little bit bored. But uh, I do know all their deficiencies. So if anybody complains, I'm going to come back to each of them because I know what they don't know, which is a lot, okay? And somehow listening to the same things uh, twice, it will never be the same, trust me, because my brain doesn't repeat things. So you will hear something different and you will do something different in the homework. So the, the course is going to have uh, six homeworks and uh, I'm gonna make basically a serious effort to have these homeworks uh, with some minimal effort, basically, to work with. So we are going to give you some of the libraries that you have to use. And we're only going to do applications of the algorithms that we discussed in class, so nothing extraordinarily sophisticated. So uh, there will be six homeworks. There's going to be a project. And the project is not going, to, I'm not going to let the class actually pick up whatever they want to, because it never works. If I ask you to pick up your own project, you will start picking up things that are way more advanced than the class. And at the end of the day, you'll be pretending doing something advanced when elementary things have escaped. So the project is going to be uh, reviewing and maybe implementing some of the references that I link in every lecture of this course. All right, so I don't want you to do anything sophisticated. I want you to expand on some algorithms that are covered in class. And we call that a project, OK? And more importantly, I would like you to come up here and give a presentation to the class because if you speak for 20 minutes, uh, it would be obvious if you have learned anything. Okay, that's the best, basically, evaluation of uh, how much you learn. So we are rather ambitious when it comes to uh, what we would like to do in this course because first we're going to have to cover uh, topics from the previous course, but also we're going to have to move to new areas. Um, so we're going to do supervised and unsupervised learning. And I'm going to give you some examples today in the review. Uh, so we're, let's say we're going to do regression models that we covered also last spring. But I'm also going to do sparse regression models. Uh, that is an advanced topic not covered before. So we're going to do a little bit of lasso uh, and Bayesian lasso and compressive sensing. I don't think we did any unsupervised uh, learning in the context of classification in the fall, so we're going to do some of those in a Bayesian setting. Um, we're going to discuss um, uh, everything you need to know about model selection. Um, we're going to discuss uh, things related obviously to model reduction, so we're going to go back and review uh, PCA and uh, Bayesian PCA and extensions. Uh, of latent variable models to model reduction. And we're going to finish with ideas from Gaussian processes. So hopefully, I will give four to five lectures on Gaussian processes. Uh, and those lectures, unfortunately, they are going to be to some uh, reasonable or research related level. I am going to have to discuss variational methods. And uh, that is an advanced topic. So that may take another two lectures. Okay? There's no other way, basically, to read the literature in Gaussian process unless we know something about variational methods. Now, you notice I 
Uh, I call the notes there machine learning because the other title was uh, too big. Plus, you know, the other title, I don't want to overlap. I know there is another machine learning course somewhere on campus. And, uh, uh, you know, so you know you have choices in life, all right? So you can go and attend uh, both courses. This course and every other course that we teach is going to be actually serious in the context of statistical methodologies, uh, algorithms. So you will see a lot of equations because I, I cannot teach basically showing you lots of pictures. Okay, you need to see equations from where they come, what the logic is, and, and uh, what the limitations are and how we extend those. All right, so I'm going to, uh, for the newcomers and everybody else, I'm going to give you some uh, uh, fast overview of the type of topics we're interested in. And, uh, uh, and in the process, I'm going to tell you how we are going to uh, advance those topics in the lectures this semester. So uh, I don't know if anybody was watching 60 Minutes the other day uh, about uh, the AI revolution in China and elsewhere. Okay, uh, but basically, I don't have to tell you much why you need to know to know about machine learning. Actually, if I understood correctly. Uh, machine and deep learning are going to uh, eliminate 45% of the jobs in the Western world, basically, I think, in the next 15 years. Okay, that was the prediction. So uh, the only jobs that machine learning is not going to uh, remove is uh, the jobs of uh, people who know statistics and machine learning. Okay, so if you are in the course, seriously, uh, it would benefit you. Uh, long-term basically profession. So uh, everything is about data, right? And we want to do, uh, to detect patterns in the data. So you know, if I throw you data, maybe you can tell me how the data are clustered. Do they come from different sources? That's something of interest. We want, uh, since we're gonna be doing Bayesian things, we want to predict future data. Especially if you don't have a lot of data, you need to figure out from where the data are coming from so find the distribution, uh, the probability density from where the data are coming from, and then sample more data that look like the ones that we started with. All right? This is what we call a generative model. And, and finally, uh, you know, at the end of the day, basically, uh, we analyze data and, and patterns in data so we can do decision making. And I think this is actually literally one of the less uh, sort of uh, uh, informed areas in the whole picture because everybody models things in high dimensions but if you ask them what do you do with it the answer is nothing but at the end of the day really what we need to do is to use that information to make decisions but how do you do decisions on data that are very high dimensional that's a very difficult topic I mean I was I had a recent conversation with uh, an important person basically emphasizing to me that this is what she's interested in, okay so decision making. So maybe we will have one lecture, or you know, during the semester on that uh, topic. Now, machine learning does not have to be probabilistic, right? I know extremely uh, uh, successful, uh, you know, uh, researchers and algorithms and methodologies that they are not probabilistic, but certainly the approach that we're going to follow this semester would be mostly probabilistic and Bayesian. Okay. Now, uh, some of the things like when we discuss about sparse modeling, I have to tell you non-Bayesian techniques because that's where the state of the art is. Things have not been extended yet to Bayesian setting. So you need to know something about uh, uh, these uh, tr more traditional sort of approaches. All right, so let me, I, this, uh, um, there is a lot of information on these slides and I want to introduce sort of terminology and notation for those who have not uh, seen it. So I'm going to try to grab some items here and there that uh, uh, maybe are not familiar. So uh, the first thing I need to do is uh, I need to define uh, what's called supervised learning. So think uh, uh, X being the input to your problem. So if you are solving some physical model, X is the inputs that you put to your uh, model and Y are the responses. And in this case, I denote the uh, input to be uh, bold, so it's a vector, so I have, uh, you know, many input variables, and why it's a scalar, okay? So, we are, so a supervised learning problem is, if I give you the input output data, and I call this set the training set, right? 
can you actually, if I give you a new x, can you tell me what the y that corresponds to that x is going to be? So the concept of supervised learning means I give you both the input and the corresponding outputs. This is what makes this problem supervised. Both the input and the output. Uh, we will see in one or two slides that uh, in unsupervised learning, I am not going to give you the labels that correspond to its uh, x. Right, so that's supervised learning. Uh, this is the training set, okay? And uh, x, uh, the input vector, comes with different names depending on uh, what books you read and with what community you, you interact. Uh, statisticians can call this the covariates, the futures, the attributes. Uh, x is our input vector. So if uh, uh, y is categorical, for example, it can be, let's say, 1 or 0, all right, then we use this for the context of classification problems. So you know, if you have a binary classification problem, you say uh, point x1 belongs to class 1, point x2 to class 0, x3 to class 1, etc. So y is categorical, and this leads to a classification problem. If it is a real number, all right, this is, uh, 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 you know, in, uh, it will be in the context of regression. But in general, for regression problems, yi doesn't have to be a scalar. Actually, yi can be a whole field in space and time. Okay, but if we can analyze this for the scalar y, uh, we will be able to, to figure out easily the rest of the problems. So, uh, so supervised learning, you know, uh, there are applications to classification, regression, and, and uh, many other settings. So in unsupervised learning, the only thing I give you is uh, uh, the axis, right? And what you need to do is you need to go to use the axis uh, and go and sort of learn some patterns in the data. So if the data are coming from different sources and, and you can sort of um, uh, classify them, let's say you, you have many Gaussians and some data are some from this Gaussian, some from that, but I don't tell you that. Can you go and discover from where the data came from? Right, they came from some Gaussian, but I don't tell you which one, this one or that one or that one, you know. So this is an unsupervised learning problem. Uh, you have to basically do what's called knowledge discovery in the data. And uh, you don't have any labels to compare things, right? So when you, let's say, if I am gonna give you a new point X and you're gonna do, try to tell me from where it came, there is nothing for you to compare. There's no like a loss function or anything like that because I have not given you any why. So in some ways, this unsupervised learning problem, it's a little bit more difficult. Okay, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, now, uh, this topic is not gonna be covered in this course, but you know, uh, I don't think we have a course like that on campus, but effectively, the idea of reinforcement learning is uh, every time you take an action, all right? There is a reward or a punishment that comes with that action, and that changes your behavior in the way you do predictions. So, you know, you can think of a Uber driver. He decides, should I wait on this street? Should I wait on that street? In order to maximize the income that he makes. And sometimes he makes the wrong decisions. He's penalized, and then he panics. He, he goes in a panic mode. He changes his decision making. He waits somewhere else. But in the process, he learns. Okay, so this reinforcement learning, it's an extremely important uh, topic and, and I think in, uh, in the context really of uh, uh, engineering and scientific applications has not been explored, uh, you know, I have not seen it basically uh, penetrating applications in engineering and the sciences yet. I know there was a recent uh, call for uh, big projects from the Department of Defense where they threw the word, and we want reinforcement learning. Uh, and I ask, you know, maybe I should not say the whole story, but basically uh, they threw it, the word there without actually knowing what they wanted. They wanted just people to start thinking just in case there was any relevance to the particular topic, okay? And certainly you can make it to have relevance to many different things. All right, so, um, by the way, feel free to, uh, uh, interrupting because now my understanding is the microphone can pick up questions so I don't have to repeat anything so if there's anything just stop me and ask any questions you may have 
So let's uh, go back to the, uh, some examples of the things I discussed on uh, supervised learning. So uh, I give you a training set, I give you some inputs and a corresponding output, so I tell you what class, let's say, uh, uh, each x belongs. Uh, the number of classes, uh, uh, let's say in this problem I give you, c equal to 2, it's a binary classification, greater than that is a, a multi-class problem. And you can have actually a multi-output classification problem uh, where simultaneously you assign something to many classes that they don't conflict with each other, so that's a very uh, interesting uh, topic. At the end of the day, uh, this is an important buzzword here. What you're interested is uh, to generalize, right? Generalize means if I give you some unseen input x, uh, once you have trained a model, can you tell me what that class that, be that x belongs to? So that's the concept of generalization. Okay, so uh, the idea is we want to learn something new and, and the something new is for uh, data that are not part of the training data set. And that set we call the test data set. So uh, an example, uh, and, and this is uh, not the ideal example to describe things, but you know, this is from Murphy's book. You can think that somehow you try, you have different objects, of different shapes and colors, and you try to put them into two classes. And um, uh, you call this class one, this class, let's say, zero, and this is your training data set, and you assign all of these objects with all of this class to, to a label one, and all of this to label zero. And the way you do this, and this will be actually the format that we implement these things in the computer, uh, you're gonna have uh, different attributes, this is your input, like color, shape, size, etc., and then uh, each of these rows will be one data, uh, one data point. So one of these objects will be uh, a row in this table, and then for each of these rows, for each n, you're going to be assigning a label. So you know this circle, you say it's a blue, and it's a circle. I give it one. Uh, this is I don't know what color is. Uh, it's not blue. I give it let's say uh, a zero. So what is generalization? Generalization is, if I give you this object, once you have trained the system and you uh, somehow try to learn from this training data set, can you tell me if this is class one or class zero? So can you guess, basically looking at the objects here, a good classifier, what do you think it will say, that this is one or zero? And what would be the logic, basically, without doing any mathematics? So we call this, let's say, class one, this class zero. <coughs> what label are you going to put on this? One. And the reason? Because of the reason is the color, because this is blue, right? And it's not blue there, all right? So you say it's one, okay? So a good classifier should be able to capture this. But if you look at this, all right? Now you're gonna say it's a circle, right? There are circles there, that is there. Uh, you say it's, uh, I don't know, is that a yellow? Uh, but there is more yellow uh, color on, on both. So what the classifier is going to do for that? So in, in, you may say, well, uh, it will not be able to tell you that it's class 1 or 0, but can it tell me that 60% is class 1 and 40% is class 0? And that's why a probabilistic model is needed, because in many of these problems, we're not going to be able to say it's day or night, right? We need to be able to assign a probability to the class that this new uh, object belongs. So we may want to say that using the training data, 60% probability to be here, 40% to be, to be there. And that is sort of an indication that we are not certain in, uh, in uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the decision making here. So, um, so how do you do basically uh, you know, probabilistic uh, inference, and how do you do predictions? The idea is, and I don't want you to read anything here, let's concentrate on this equation, okay? And for those who have not taken these courses before, so it may look a little bit uh, different, so uh, uh, let me explain everything in, in uh, here. So this calligraphic D in all our slides will indicate the training data set. And the training data set is basically 
these objects with these futures, this belongs to class one, this belongs to class zero. So this is our training data set, okay? And uh, X is an unseen input, all right? And what we're asking is, what is the probability that the class of X is C? Of course, C is one, two, you know, depending on how many classes we have. And in particular, we want to assign X to one class only. What we do is we're saying, find the little C that maximizes this probability, and, uh, and then we give that label to X. We say X belongs to class one or to class zero. Okay? Uh, now, this probability, as you see it here, it's a posterior distribution because you notice it is a condition of the training data. So it's really a predictive posterior distribution. And we will see this in uh, uh, a lecture or two analytically. But effectively, this is the type of decisions we need to make. If we have the training data, we need to be able, when we have a new input X, we need to be able to assign it to some class. And a good way to assign it is using this argument here. But you notice this argument here. It says find the C that maximizes this probability. So it only finds you one class. So it will not tell you, oh, you know what? 60% you're on this class, 40% you're on another class. So what really this is, is what we call it's a point estimate. So it's not really fully Bayesian. It makes a decision for you, but it's not really a probabilistic decision, even though it uses probabilities. All right? In other ways, if you have computed this posterior distribution, you should actually make use of it, not just find the C that maximizes and say that's it. There's way much more that you can do. Okay, and we will see this when uh, uh, we discuss about Bayesian inference. So this estimate here is the maximum posteriori, uh, uh, maximum posteriori probability. Uh, okay, is the C that maximizes this posterior? Uh, it's a point estimate, and point estimates basically are not very good because uh, you know they don't come with confidence intervals, and uh, they can overfit. And uh, uh, if you have very limited data, basically, there may be very bad uh, uh, predictions that we get doing things uh, this way. All right, so let me uh, give you another example. Um, and uh, we will see this when we do classification problems. Uh, so this, uh, again, don't read everything uh, there. So what you see here is uh, uh, its line corresponds Right, so this is like a matrix, if you like, and each row corresponds to a different document taken from a textbook in the library or one of your textbooks that you like to read, okay? And each uh, block, uh, you know, from zero to hundred are different words in the in the in the document. So what you have here is you have one thousand documents, and uh, this black on white little boxes that you see is if a particular word belongs to the document or not. So when you see, for example, this is a specific word, when you see this uh, Y says that word is not in that document, okay? So what uh, has been done here is somehow trying to figure out uh, what words are common in the different documents and then uh, classify the documents, in this particular case, in four classes based on the uh, uh, presence or absence of certain words. Right? I mean, if I extract uh, uh, documents from a computer science book, from a, you know, uh, a fiction book, or uh, anything you, you would like, and I tell you, tell me uh, how many different types of books I gave you, what categories you have, uh, this type of um, classification will allow you to basically uh, do this. And this model that you see here, the binary model that accounts for words that are present or not, is what is called the bag of words model um, uh, for representing documents. And we will see later on that this is not a very good uh, model for documents, so we would have to, uh, when we discuss about classification, we have to do um, uh, you know, a little bit better than uh, this type of uh, model. I mean, you can think when you use this representation, there are some words that belong to every document. Right, you say V, V belongs to every document, you know, or A belongs to every document. 
So how do you separate these things and you remove all these things out, all right? Uh, because effectively what you need to do is you need to see not, uh, you need to see for the presence of rare words that identify each class, that they are informative. And, and this type of representation is not very important. Um, I, it's, there's a very high chance that you will do a homework with this uh, data set because you can, it's sort of a nice data set to do a lots of uh, 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 different uh, sort of uh, implementations to classification models. So imagine that uh, you try to, I'm not very good with flowers, okay? So I am not going to read the type of flowers that you have here. But somehow, let's uh, uh, say that I give you some input features that you see here, the sepal length, you know, the petal length and, and width, etc. So I give you, let's say, an input vector for each flower that is, has a dimension four. And um, uh, I give you some, uh, a training data set. Uh, and, uh, and then somehow I want to create a model uh, that if I give you an input vector, you can tell me what flower it is. Okay? So uh, the idea in, in um, and this will be common for classification problems and to some extent for regression models. Before you do anything, you need to do some pre-processing of the data because effectively pre-processing may actually tell you in part uh, the, 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 you know, what is going on in, in, uh, in your data set and may facilitate significantly the classification process. So if you look, let's say, on uh, this flower, the cetosis, which are these red circles, and you check the width and the length, you can see basically uh, that they're always uh, on the bottom of this, uh, uh, you know, scattered uh, uh, plots, okay? So immediately you can identify if something is a cetosis or not by looking at this, let's say, diagrams, okay? So this is immediately separated from uh, uh, the other two flowers, but the other two flowers you can see uh, in all the plots, basically this, uh, I don't know what color is that, yellow and blue, they overlap, so it's very difficult to actually say much uh, uh, about that. So you need to do an exploratory data analysis. You need to basically uh, try to plot some histograms and, and see what variables are important in the model and what's, which ones you need to remove. Maybe you can do this in four dimensions. If your problem is in 100 dimensions, that will not work. Okay, so um, it will not be very useful. This is sort of a data set uh, that uh, you will, uh, if you go even to important machine learning conferences, you will find uh, uh, several papers. They are still working uh, and implementing and testing algorithms using this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, MNIST, uh, uh, you know, handwritten uh, uh, digit data set. So the idea here is again, uh, you're going to, uh, you know, you're going, I'm gonna give you uh, a, a training data set, and I'm gonna say this is seven, this is two, this is one. And then, you know, somebody writes a weird letter and you're gonna have to, predict, to do a prediction as to what that, le that um, uh, number is. This sounds a, a trivial problem, but this uh, actually not a trivial problem because each of you, when they write a seven, you know, you write it with different orientations. The sizes of the horizontal line and the diagonal is different. The angles are different. So how are you actually can you learn this? Of course, if you have thousands, millions of data sets, you can learn anything, all right? And so big data sets work, but somehow you need to be able to have algorithms that are capable to do predictions that they are sort of invariant to rotation and stretching of these digits. So for example, if I take this seven and you know, I can write seven, or I can go like that and write seven, how will you know the orientation of the digit? Okay, and so that is uh, not necessarily a trivial problem to be able to uh, have algorithms that are invariant to uh, deformation, uh, stretching, rotations, and, and the likes. Now in the old days, uh, if you want to use generic algorithms, people say, look, I don't even really care that there is this seven like that. Uh, I want, even if you take, uh, you know, if you think of this image as a pixelized form, let's say 100 by 100, and you take and you switch the locations of these uh, white and, and, uh, and black uh, pixels, 
and I give you these images like that, there are algorithms that are generic enough that they can do predictions for you even in this case. But obviously, if you try to do predictions like that, means you don't really account uh, for the fact that, uh, you know, if it is white here, there's a higher chance that it will be white next to it. Okay? So you're missing basically the correlations uh, that you observed uh, on the left if you use something generic that you see on the right. So uh, generic methods are not advised anymore to be used in this type of problems. All right. Um, uh, you, you know, you have seen this, and I uh, don't know if there's anybody, people from electrical engineering, but, you know, when um, uh, uh, I was actually, if anybody saw the 60 Minutes uh, show on Sunday, they were showing how this automated uh, face recognition system that they have in China, it can follow you, thousands of people walking on the road, and it puts a little square on its face, and next to the little square it tells you young, Greek, beard, you know, nice hair, etc. It gives you basically a whole uh, sort of uh, evaluation based on the, what the, the, your profile looks like as an image. Okay? And they can do this, so they can do not only face detection, uh, eventually they will be able to do face recognition, they will be able to follow you and know uh, where you go, what you eat, everything. Okay? And uh, so these uh, uh, you know, your uh, automatic camera basically does this, do face recognition, we take pictures. Uh, this uh, Google Street View system, you know, does the opposite. When it sees a face, it uh, blares the face, so they don't have to worry about uh, uh, you showing them that uh, you appear on, uh, on uh, Google Street Maps, basically. All right, so let me uh, uh, move a little bit to to uh, the supervised learning and, and a fundamental problem because we're going to be discussing about surrogate modeling in this course. So this is uh, the problem of regression. And uh, this particular pictures you will see, we will discuss all of this right in detail when we uh, reach the point to, to go through regression algorithms. But basically what I give you here is, I give you some input and uh, output data, these blue dots, and your job is basically not to fit some line or some polynomial that you see on the top three pixels, but really to be able for any new input to tell me what Y is and what your uh, confidence in your prediction is going to be. So we're really, in a Bayesian setting, we're not interested in interpolation, all right? We're interested in extrapolation in some sense. And uh, now, this plus that you see here can actually be Bayesian where this is sort of some expectation of your response, if you like. Okay? And when uh, we will see this uh, in details, but what I want you to observe is, right, so in, in this data set, you fit a line, uh, you fit a parabola, and then you fit uh, a degree 20th polynomial. Which of those uh, you like the most? Now, if you were, you know, an undergraduate, all right, you say fantastic, the best interpolation, congratulations, you got an A plus. The idea here is, right, yes, I interpolate it nicely, uh, I take care of all my training points, but if I try to do predictions at some other location, will that prediction be good? The answer is no, because here you're fitting to noise in the observations, you're not fitting actually the data, okay? So, uh, of course, then the question is, is model one better than model two? That's something we need to discuss in a Bayesian setting where we uh, let the data speak for themselves to figure out what type of model uh, is appropriate for this data set. Uh, something that uh, we will learn, uh, and, uh, and it is sort of universal in this type of algorithms, is to plot some sort of an error, and this is a mean square error, for the training data set and for the test data set. Remember, the training data set is based on how well did you do on these blue dots that I gave you. The test is how, do you, how well did you do on, uh, on your predictions on, uh, on input data that you have not seen before, okay? So if you look at this picture, what it does is, uh, this is the degree of the polynomial that you use in the interpolation. 
this is the mean square error. And so let's concentrate on the training uh, error, all right? So the training error uh, is very high, and then it goes down, all right? So you know, you may say, wow, this is the higher the polynomial, the better. That's my choice. But this paradigm here, if we take it to something like that, where predictions are not going to be very good, because you're going to be fitting the noise. And you can see this, why this high pol order polynomial is not going to be very good. Because if you plot the same error that you do for the test data set, not for the one that you used to train, but for some unseen data set, notice how the plot goes like. And this, again, is sort of a universal. The testing error is very high to start with. Then it goes down, then it sort of stabilizes, and then it goes up. OK? So obviously, you don't want a degree of polynomial there. You don't want a degree of polynomial there. Somewhere there is the correct model that you need to have uh, uh, for this particular data set in the context, again, of predictions in a way that you avoid, avoid the overfitting. Um, so we're going to learn how to do this type of things. And uh, literally, here you see in one dimension, our objective is to be able to do these models in uh, 50 or 100 or 600 or 1,000 dimensions, all right? And, and I want you not sort of to be, uh, uh, to go tomorrow to your advisor and say, you know, uh, I'm doing this fitting in one dimension or in two dimensions. You know, just use your imagination and say, you know what? I can do this in 1,000 dimensions, maybe with the same algorithm, literally, OK? And, uh, and there will be some challenges, and we will see them on the way. But th this challenge is, they are sort of algorithmic, but they are also mathematical and statistical in nature. And sometimes there is nothing you can do in some uh, high dimensions. Uh, uh, and I think I have a slide later that uh, we will. Uh, this, as the dimensionality goes up, right? There is a point where you, you give up uh, because uh, of complexities that they are natural to this type of problems. All right. So let me go back to the uh, supervised and unsupervised learning uh, and uh, uh, remind you what it's all about. So you remember in the, in the supervised learning, like a regression problem, we started with, uh, I give you inputs and outputs, right? And the objective is to actually, for each input, to compute the probability of the output. So if I give you new, uh, the input of a function, you tell me what the function value is. Right, that's a supervised uh, learning problem. And then the supervised learning problem is basically learning uh, the unconditional probability distribution of x. I don't give you labels y. So if, uh, you know, if I give you data, again, that come from a cluster of five Gaussians, somehow you need to predict this distribution and, and figure out patterns in the distribution that indicate uh, that your data come from uh, this uh, uh, five Gaussians. So uh, let me explain this because it will take us you know, a few lectures uh, in the course uh, to discuss it. Suppose I, you know, I have uh, two dimensional data, and this is the weight and height of uh, individuals or something else. And uh, so I give you these data points, and I am not clustering them. So let's say. I don't know the particular problem, but let's say this comes from uh, people in three different cities, all right? Maybe in Chicago, they're overweight. In South Bend, they're very uh, lean. I don't know, OK? So this pixel that you see here uh, has no labels. It doesn't tell you uh, from where this data came. So if they came from three clusters, you don't see it. So this has uh, no colors on it. Now, if you look, let's say, on this picture, Suddenly, you see three different colors. So when we do unsupervised learning, our objective will actually be the following. If I give you this, can you plot me that? Can you go and figure out that this data set came in different three different clusters? And that leads to the concept, uh, which is very fundamental to machine learning, of uh, hidden or latent variables. So can you extrapolate uh, for a given point, what is a hidden or a latent variable? So like for this data set, what do you think? For if I take a point, what do you think I am going to call the corresponding 
uh, latent variable or hidden variable to that part. So for each point, I'm going to assign a hidden variable. And that hidden variable is going to capture what? It's going to capture uh, the class, let's say, or it's going to capture the labels, all right? The labels that generate in these data points. So if, let's say, you know, you have generated these points with one Gaussian, this with another Gaussian, another Gaussian, then it will tell you that this point, you know what? It comes from this Gaussian, OK? So in, in some sense, it's like learning the generative mapping uh, from the latent space, which is here to there. Because these points really were generated by starting knowing their labels. If I know that this is, comes from this Gaussian, I go and sample the Gaussian, and there are the points. I'm not going to generate these points in some other random fashion. Means I must know from where they come. But now I give them to you, and I tell you, go and figure out from where they came. You have to go and do the reverse problem. From this um, uh, unlabeled data points, you may have to go backwards, and you're going to have to assign labels and tell me from where it's data point came from. OK? So in some sense, there's some similarities with regression, because in regression, right, you go from input, which is, uh, let's say here, the latent variables to the output, which is that. Here, what we need to do is go do the opposite. We need to go from uh, the output, if you like. We need to go to figure out the input that's generated. And that input is hidden. And, uh, and in this case, we call it Z. And the name is hidden or latent variable. It is an extremely fundamental problem in statistics and machine learning. Uh, and and uh, uh, let me just tell you the good news. The good news is the following, that somehow, instead of working in the real space X, let's say, if you work in the enhanced space of X and Z, most of the problems in machine learning become easier, way easier. So if you knew the labels, everything is easy. Of course, you don't know the labels, so we're going to have to develop algorithms that are iteratively that will allow us to assign labels to each of the data points. So here is, for example, uh, an assignment. So once, let's say, somehow you develop some algorithms and you train a system with some uh, data uh, B that I gave you, what you need to do is, if I give you now a new data point X, you're going to have to uh, uh, sort of uh, figure out what is the latent, uh, what is the color basically of that point? From what class did it come from? And this is again like a map estimate. You're going to compute the, the posterior of that point, let's say being a yellow point or being a green point or being a blue point, and then somehow uh, select the color that maximizes these posteriors. Okay? So, in some ways, this is a, again linked to. Uh, to this concept of model selection. I mean, in principle here, the complexity is even uh, a little bit worse than I, I described, because you know I, we look at these pictures, and we assume that there are three colors. No one told us there are three colors, right? We don't know how many colors there are. So in some sense, you can th think of coming up with a posterior distribution over the number of colors. And you know, there's various ways of, of uh, doing this. And somehow, you know, uh, you need maybe to find the map estimate of that distribution. So you may need to find, you know, what is the, the map estimate that gives you the number of colors that best explain your data. And that requires that you compute uh, that distribution. All right. Um, so since we talk about latent variables and, and uh, uh, you know, unsupervised learning. I mean, part of the course that we need to, you know, it's on the title of the course is model reduction. So we need to be able uh, somehow to reduce the dimensionality of data uh, because in, in real life, most data look very high dimensions, uh, very high dimensional, but really the data live in some uh, low dimensional uh, manifold. So in this case, this data are in three dimensions, but you can easily see that really the data can be projected nicely in a, in a 2D plane. 
okay, that you see here on the, on the right. So one of the techniques that uh, we will discuss uh, that everything started and, and everything has to be related to is versions of what is called the principal component analysis uh, and, and the Bayesian version of this, the Bayesian PCA. And, and, uh, and then we will have to go to much more complex techniques. Um, I don't know to which level we will discuss non-Bayesian uh, techniques because there are lots of uh, modern reduction techniques that they are uh, uh, very well used, but they are non-Bayesian. But somehow we're going to spend maybe uh, five lectures to discuss about how we reduce the dimensionality uh, uh, of data. You'd be surprised that if you understand uh, how uh, PCA works, the way to implement PCA is literally two lines of a computer program. It's two lines. Okay, and, and so it's nothing sophisticated, but uh, and, uh, uh, at the end of the day, I, uh, some days I, I have students telling me, oh, you know, I worked on this method for two years, but PCA still does better. And I don't know if I should believe that or I should believe the student or what, okay? So PCA is very good for uh, simple problems in low dimensions, in higher dimensions, uh, for complex data. Um, uh, you are left basically, uh, you know, to to identify the proper technique to do uh, model reduction. We will also talk about uh, other methods, uh, including what is called uh, independent component analysis. If we have time, which is a little bit different in uh, principle from uh, PCA. So here is, uh, uh, you know, doing model reduction. Of, uh, of these images that corresponds to different faces of people, okay? So let me describe mathematically the problem, okay? The idea is, so think of these images. Each of these images, if you pixelize a very high dimensional vector, right? So if the, each of these images, let's say it's 100 pixels by 100, so it's 10,000 vector, all right? So you're asking, are these guys really 10,000 dimensional uh, objects? Because, you know, there is very significant correlation, right? When you look at the face, you can actually capture lots of the cheeks and this and the nose with very low dimensional features. So do you really need 10,000 dimensions? So the idea here is that if, if we call these pixels here, these images, Y, the idea is that there is some low dimensional description, Z, that generates these images. But somehow, maybe something in five dimensions is good enough through some mapping to capture this 10,000 dimensional image. All right? I am not telling you what the mapping is going to be, because the mapping may be very complex. But the idea is something that is very low dimension, I can pull it through some mapping to generate this image. So these ideas of bond reduction go the opposite way. They don't, we don't know this generative uh, uh, way of going from these latent reduced variables to y. We want to go backwards from y to figure out what z is. Of course, if you manage to do this properly, at the end of the day, you would like to be able to sample different z's and generate new faces that you have never seen before. And maybe you have seen uh, presentations on models as, such as uh, guns and the likes that uh, this generative adversarial networks that effectively what you do is you sample z and then you generate some new uh, faces that look like real but they're not real so uh, to do this pca thing for uh, uh, for this uh, uh, faces and again uh, the problem is uh, literally it's uh, two lines of a computer program um, you know, so it's, uh, it's quite easy, but to actually go to nonlinear mappings and trying to build a probabilistic model uh, from Z to Y and the other way around, it's uh, a little bit more involved. The, uh, this, you know, what you see on this uh, slide, uh, it's a subject of uh, another course that I taught uh, uh, last uh, year. Uh, you know, if somebody, if you have a lot of variables in your model, right? And in engineering, we have hundreds of variables that they relate, they correlate with each other. 
if I give you realizations of these variables, one of the problems is, can you go and find what variable correlates with what? So you can think of this, if correlations imply that these variables are linked together through this uh, graph structure, uh, you can think of the problem as discovering what is the optimal structure of this graph that captures the correlations implied by the data. So, uh, so discovering graph structure is a major problem uh, in machine learning, and we're not going to uh, discuss it in this uh, course. But some of the algorithms that we will see are basically what you will need to use to be able to, uh, to work on this type of problems. All right, um, a, a new sort of, um, uh, a new uh, terminology there, uh, to be sure um, uh, we clear this thing out. So parametric versus non-parametric models. Can somebody without reading tell me what's a parametric model and what's a non-parametric model in statistics? How do we understand a parametric model? What does it mean when you have a parametric model? Parameters, a parametric model. Model with parameters. Hmm? Model with parameters. Model? No, no, it's okay. You said model didn't kill the second part. No, uh, with parameters. Ways? Uh, yeah, with parameters. Way parameters? Yes. All right. So think, you know, if you have a bunch of data, right? and you want to fit them to some distribution, you say, I am going to assume that the distribution is Gaussian. So you put some structure in your data, you assume that it's Gaussian, and then you say, can, you know, if it's a Gaussian, what's the mean, what's the variance? That's a parametric model. The fact that you already have assumed that there is a structure there, and that structure is Gaussian, it's a very heavy duty assumption. All right? And it is an assumption that somehow you have to live with it, right? So you reduce the problem to computing, one of computing uh, a, a number of parameters, and this number of parameters has nothing to do with the number of data sets that we started with. So if I give you, let's say, if you're going to try to fit a data set to a Gaussian, this algorithm will not care if I give you 100 data points or a million data points or anything like that. So this is called a parametric uh, uh, modeling, and I would say it's sort of the most uh, widely used technique in statistics and machine learning, not because it's the best, but because it's the simplest. Okay? Uh, non parametric statistics, on the other hand, you assume that the number of parameters grows with the amount of the training data. And you can think the typical example, like we discuss uh, these things with the latent models, for each X, you affiliate the latent variable. So the more the X is, the more the latent variables. Okay? There are no parameters here, right? Uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a lot of data, basically you can think of this, you have infinite parameters. Uh, but these non-parametric models are a little bit more difficult to, uh, to train, but they perform way better than parametric models. I mean, you can think, you know, if I, uh, and, and we will uh, discuss this, maybe even this example in the slides, if I give you a data set, right, and you try to fit the distribution, you can say, oh, my distribution is a Gaussian mixture with this weights and, or unknown weights and unknown means for each Gaussian and unknown variance. So that would be a parametric model. And no parametric model would be, you know what, I have an infinite mixture of Gaussians. I don't even know how many Gaussians there are. So you allow for everything. OK? And those models actually perform the best. OK, those models perform the best. And, and, and I would say this uh, non-parametric models is sort of uh, uh, a very active uh, research area with a lot of applications uh, that uh, are relevant uh, in the context of machine learning today. So let me uh, uh, discuss some of these uh, non-parametric models just uh, so to, to get you your imagination to flow. Uh, and we will see this uh, 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 in, in details as we go. But again, if you can get the idea on, on 
one plot, one, uh, one slide, uh, really there's not very much uh, uh, beyond what you see on this plot here. So let me uh, see what we have here. So what we, you know, so we are trying to build a classifier, right? We're trying to classify points to different classes. And I give you uh, a bunch of training data sets. And you notice I have uh, here, let's say, binary classifier. So I mark this point red. I mark this point uh, uh, dark, you know. And so I, uh, this is my training data set. And now what I would like to do is, if you give me any arbitrary point, I would like you to tell me what class that point belongs. Is it red or it's uh, black? And the whole algorithm is this equation here that goes under the name of k nearest neighbor classifier. And I want you to look at this equation without reading anything. Try to read the equation. Uh, this i here is an indicator function. When the argument is true, it's 1. When it's not, it's 0. So I want you to look at this equation alone and tell me what the algorithm is all about. And again, this is sort of a posterior distribution. The idea here is I have done some training of the system. so this. This is my training data. The training data is these dots that I gave you with colors. All right, and now I want for a given x to tell you what's the probability that it belongs to class C, which is the dark class or the red class. So how do I compute this probability? Look at this and, and, uh, and extrapolate from the name uh, k uh, nearest neighbor classifier, which is here. So what this, this thing does. So for, it, for this particular point that I'm interested, right, what I do is I look to the neighborhood that incorporates k points, k neighbors. k can be 5. So you say, let's keep moving around the a sphere until I reach 5 of you. All right? And, and uh, so that's what you see here. And then what do you do? Once you have that neighbor, you sum how many times. So you look in the neighborhood. And you look at what? So if you look, you look, let's say, if you are interested in class uh, red, you look at that neighborhood and you say, what's the percentage of the point in that neighborhood that they are red? And then that's the probability you assign to that x. OK? And of course, this is a risky proposition, right? Because what you can do is you can look at the neighborhood that includes only one person. So as, as soon as I hit one of you, I stop. Or I can take the whole room and average over the whole room. And uh, so in this plot, what do you think I do? How many neighbors do you look on this uh, plot? This is a very famous sort of plot, right? Uh, you can see these lines here. The, if you take the distance between two neighbors, this line here by sextant distance, and this line here by sextant distance, and this line there by sextant distance. So uh, you form these Voronoi tessellations, and then effectively, what do you do? Like if I look on, uh, on uh, that uh, domain, what color do I assign everything in this domain? Red. All right? So a Volonoid Tellesolation, it is the simplest sort of implementation of this k nearest neighbor classifier, uh, where the neighbors you look is the number is equal to 1. OK? Um, and the algorithm looks trivial, right? If you search on the web, Volonoid Tellesolations, you know, people are using it. Uh, for everything these days, from doing finite element modeling to uh, uh, anything else. Uh, but this algorithm is extremely powerful, at least in concept. But you notice it depends strongly, uh, even though it's, you know, we don't fit things to a Gaussian or anything like that, right? This distribution is non parametric. And even though it's non parametric, there is that coefficient k that defines the number of neighbors. And uh, depending on what choice you make on that k, uh, you can underfit or overfit, uh, uh, you know, in uh, your predictions. 
So uh, if you implement this uh, uh, probabilistically, effectively what you will uh, um, you know, uh, be able to compute is, so this is the training data set, okay, uh, with labels, with colors, and what you see on this plot is the posterior that, is that you are in class one, so you know, this is, let's say, class one, the blue, this is class two, I don't know what the color is, and this is class three. So this, it gives you the probability that you're class one, uh, given the data, so this is a posterior distribution, and the number of neighbors that I use is equal to 10, okay? So you can see here, this probability is very high. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, why does it look like this? So maybe the colors are uh, messed up, right? So I was expecting this to be blue, okay. Uh, you know what it is done? I think maybe we cut some colors here. No, looks good. Huh? Yeah, so, uh, so basically, at the end of the day, right, you come up that this is one, this is the probability here. Uh, so this is for the red class? Okay, all right. So, so somehow the probability here is very low and up there is very high. And, uh, and uh, you notice even though k equal to 10, from what I see is there is some zigzagging, right? So things are not very smooth, which means if you try to do predictions, you can have two points that are very close to each other, and somehow one will be red, one will be blue. That's not good, all right? So this doesn't look to me very appealing. But again, this is the, the posterior probability that you're class two. And, uh, and this plot, what it gives you is, for each region, it gives you the map estimate. It gives you what class has the highest probability in that region. So this is uh, class uh, two, this is uh, class uh, three, and uh, this is class one, all right? So once you have all of these probabilities, you can select in each domain which one has the highest probability, and then say every point here I'm gonna assign to class two, every point there is gonna be class three, and every point there is class one. Uh, so, you know, you can, the idea here is you can use this uh, 10 years neighbor algorithm in a fully Bayesian setting, and uh, we will discuss a little bit uh, about this and how we do model selection. All right, we have uh, um, a few minutes left, so let me try to tell you the challenges uh, that um, you need to face in, in, uh, in statistics. Um, so consider that I have a cube of size one, and uh, there is uh, points on this cube that they are uniformly distributed, right? So, and I, you can think of this cube being uh, in three dimensions, but really what I would like you to, uh, to extrapolate is, uh, the situation for this cube will be, let's say, in 100 dimensions, right? So we have a hypercube in high dimensions. So here is what the question I wanted to ask. So this cube is a unit cube in three dimensions, and eventually we're going to make this in d dimensions. So I'm asking you, I want to cut a little cube, all right, this blue cube here, in a way that cons it contains f percentage of the total points of the unit cube. So I'm saying, what is that little cube that I can come with that contains, say, 10% of the, the points of the unit cube, or 80% uh, or 90%? So the size of the cube is f to 1 over d. You can think about it, right? I mean, the, the volume of the cube will be f 1 over d times the power of d. You get f, which is the percentage of points. So the size of the cube that contains set percentage of these points is f to the power 1 over d. So let's plot this. So what you see here is uh, f. So this is 10% of the points, 20%, 100%. And this is this edge of this blue uh, cube uh, for d equal to 10. And you can imagine if d equal to 20 it will go like that. And it will start actually touching the, ver the horizontal line on the top. So what do you conclude when you look at this plot? What does it mean? If you want 10% of the points, in very high dimensions, what is the size of the blue cube? Well, 
look at this. If I want 10% for something in 50 dimensions, what is the size of the, of the blue cube? Very large. You know what that means? That in high dimensions, all the points really are on the boundary. Even though you say, but it's uniformly distributed, yeah, but you know they're on the boundary. Okay? So effectively, to reach 10% of the points in, let's say, 30 dimensions, the size of this cube has to become almost equal to the original cube of size 1. And so that is an issue, right? Because uh, if you think of the k nearest neighbor algorithm, you look at the neighbor, which and you say, uh, find the distance where I have three of these neighbors. If I want three of you in uh, one million dimensions, it means I have to take the whole of this room and more. But then you're going to say, me here and you down there, we're not neighbors. Are we neighbors? How can I do k nearest neighbor type of assignments when the distance basically in high dimensions between two points is really huge? All right? So the concept, uh, first, you know, everything you know about uh, uh, the three-dimensional world is not valid in high dimensions. Certainly is not valid in probability space, okay? The concept of a neighbor in high dimensions is also lousy uh, because, you know, of the paradigm here that you can find yourself calling a neighbor someone that is huge distance. So whatever they do or the label they have is not relevant to you anymore. Okay? Uh, so this is a serious challenge. And the only way to really uh, address it is by, uh, it's really by doing some other reduction. By putting some structure in the data and say, yeah, things are in maybe 100 dimensions, but in reality this data can live in 10 dimensions. Okay? Or they, they can be generated from some later representation in 10 dimensions. Um, and uh, this is this assumptions basically that you have to introduce in your model is what is called in statistics, statistics uh, inductive bias. Okay, you basically have to put some uh, structures, some assumptions in the model uh, to be able to make it amenable to this type of uh, uh, of modeling uh, that we show examples today uh, uh, in statistics. So let me uh, uh, give you an example of a, an uh, inductive uh, bias uh, model. And uh, it's going to be a little bit ahead of, uh, uh, you know, today I only supposed to introduce problems, right? But I'm going to throw you examples that those who have taken other classes uh, with me or others uh, have seen this before. So let's think of this uh, regression problem from uh, input x to some output y that's a scalar. So what you see here is uh, it's a structural model of regression that says, you know what, for any x, uh, my uh, response is some parameters, w transpose x, plus some noise, right? And, you know, you make that noise to be Gaussian or something like that, but you transform the problem to some uh, nice structural model, okay? And uh, if you make this model, this noise to be Gaussian, all right, this distribution this thing implies a distribution that is a Gaussian that has a mean W transpose X, right? This is your regression line. And um, the unknowns of the problem basically become uh, the, the Ws and uh, the noise, the variance in, in uh, your model sigma square that I'm taking here to be, uh, you know, uh, to be constant, independent of X. So the idea here is, you know, if you don't make these models right, and you try sort of uh, out of nowhere to come up with a predictive distribution of y given x, you're not going to go anywhere. You need to basically use your gut feeling and say, you know what, uh, Gaussian noise is good, a linear model will do OK. So this is what I'm going to use, and this is what I'm going to try to interpret the data with. OK? Um, and um, so the pictures that I showed you before, basically, they're this type of uh, uh, models. The only difference, uh, instead of having an x here, I am trying to generalize and say, you know, how about instead of x, if I can use some nonlinear functions of x? 
So if I have an input, let's say x1, x2, x3, how about if I allow x1, x2, x1, x3, or x1 squared, or some basis functions that can be sines or cosines or anything like that. And so you can generalize the model. You say maybe this is much better model with much better predictive capacity. Actually, this model is so powerful uh, that you can do a lot of interesting things. So you can take these functions to be uh, support vector machines, for example, or you can take these functions to be represented by neural networks. All right? So even though something looks literally very simple as a mathematical model, you can expand its potential by keep adding more complexity uh, uh, in the representation, in this case, of, of the mean. And also, you can do a lot of other things with the variance uh, uh, as well. So this is basically the same uh, uh, plot now for a linear regression problem. And again, you notice that for every x, you produce a probability of y given x. And this probability is picked basically around this line that is the mean. Uh, it's the regression line, all right? Uh, but effectively, you have a whole probability. So at this point, not only you can predict the mean, but you can say something about the confidence in, in, uh, in your predictions. Uh, can you do this type of structural models, this, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, this idea uh, for classification? And we will see on uh, one, one or two lectures. The answer is yes. Uh, since here, the idea for classification problems is to assign labels to each point x. So what you do is you are going to fit uh, a Bernoulli distribution. So if you think of why the labels you assign are 0 or 1, you're going to assign a label 1 with probability mu and a label 0 with probability 1 minus mu. And that is what's a Bernoulli distribution. And what do you use as mu? You can use, again, it goes back to a simple uh, linear model that we transpose x. But because this has to be a probability, you pass it through a sigmoid function that um, varies from 0 to 1. All right? So basically, you want to be sure that the probability is not equal to 25. So you map this through this function. Uh, from W transpose X, whatever you get through the sigmoid function that you see here, you get the probability. So at the end of the day, if somebody gives you training data of two classes, all right, so this is class one and this is class two, what you do is uh, you can fill uh, this sigmoid and say all the points that give you a probability above 0.5 is class one, below 0.5 is class zero. Uh, and the only thing I wanted to emphasize on this, and we will see all this in details, we will spend uh, at least one lecture on this topic, is that these models, they are actually are not perfect because uh, they do mistakes even in the training data points. So for example, that point there uh, was belonging to class one, but now because this is the new classification boundary, it belongs to class zero. So not only you do errors on, when you do testing, but you do errors uh, when you do training as well. But again, the idea is simple mathematical models with simple linearities and some nonlinearities to come up with probabilities allow you uh, to uh, work nicely on, on uh, classification and, and regression problems. All right. And, uh, um, so when you finish at the end of the day, right, you need to have a criterion that says uh, how good uh, you are doing. And I already uh, mentioned to you for regression that you need to uh, plot the training and the testing error. And you're mostly uh, interested for uh, the testing error. And you may ask, what do I use for test error and training error in classification problems? So can you look at this equation and tell me what is a good measure of the classification error. Look at this equation here. Give me a name on this. How should I call this error? This is an indication, indicator function, right? So let's say for training, I give you its point xi, right? And I give you the labels, what class it belongs. And this is my mathematical model. So this says, you know what? Measure how many times your model does what? It misclassifies things. It gives you the wrong labels, basically. So that's a misclassification error. 
So whatever I showed you before for integration, for you use the mean square error, you can do this with a, a misclassification error for classification problems. And the plots literally look similar. So you will see, for example, for the test error, uh, uh, the error is very high here, very high there. So really, you need to operate some work in that regime. Uh, this is in the context of uh, K-nearest neighbors, but you, know, you can generalize this uh, to other problems as well. The way to, uh, the prime way to, uh, uh, to, do, to do this uh, uh, validation of your model is to uh, use what's called cross-validation, where effectively if you have a big data set, uh, what you do is, as you see in this plot, I split the data set in four pieces, and uh, I'm sorry, five pieces. I train it in four, and then I test it how well it does in the last uh, fifth piece. And I repeat this. So this is my testing data set. This is my testing data set. So when you do this and you average over these five runs, you can come up with what's called a cross-validation uh, uh, error. And uh, if you split, if you have, let's say, n points, and you split it in n pieces, then this leads to an algorithm that's called leave one out cross-validation. So use all the points but one. Do predictions in that point. Then you use all the points but another point now, do predictions, and then average. People in Bayesian settings don't like this. And they don't like this because you have to do all these calculations again and again. And so there is uh, uh, too much computational time. Sometimes there's nothing else to do. Or a reviewer will demand that you do this uh, cross validation analysis. And bottom line, 146, I told them we need two extra minutes to finish. Bottom line, uh, whatever you learn in this class, right, and, and whatever you read in books and papers, don't uh, uh, extrapolate that everything is, uh, is working for every data set, for every pro uh, problem, for every case. Uh, the idea here is there is no freelance theory, okay? And 